Hi, everybody, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. Yeah. This is AJ Hannenberg. I am here with Graham Donaldson. Hello. And Thomas Magby. Hi. And we three are generalists who delve into classical topics and then try to bring that stuff to you in a way that is palatable and not terrible. And that's what our podcast is all about. Think of us like time travelers. Okay. Going back in time yes. and finding the choicest morsels okay. and bringing it back to the modern world and giving it to them. In Except a, without the horrible things that usually come with time travel. And right. us accidentally like stepping on a beetle that yeah. changes the course of like, history. makes my grandma a dinosaur. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like the weird stuff that comes with time travel. Good. Yeah. So we're, that's we're, us. We're, we're just really good at it. Okay. We, just, we don't disrupt the timeline when we go back. We're good. really careful. I've never messed with a butterfly. Never messed good. with a butterfly. We didn't punch baby Hitler or whatever. Like, And all I do is record the lottery numbers. <laughs> I haven't yet acted on them. I actually <laughs> use them. So I feel like we're missing something on that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So today, Graham is going to be taking us down some more of that old Plantagenet road. Some more right. of them kings, more of them old Englishmen with the... I, you know, half of this is just me imagining bad mouthful of, mouthfuls of teeth. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Plenty of that. Yes. Yeah. Just like every good trilogy... There's a part four. <laughs> and then... <laughs> and then the part four capitalizes on the nostalgia. And so the big wigs at the table say, hey, part four made a lot of money. Let's do a part five. And here we are, gentlemen. <laughs> part part five. five of our Plantagenet trilogy. And the Roman numeral for part five is so satisfying. Just it's a big v. v. Instead of an IV like four, that <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Now, Rocky Five was, if I recall correctly, don't they make fun of it on uh, Simpsons and like Adrian's Revenge? No, sorry, it's Rocky Eight. Anyway, um, are they, they really? make fun of everything on Simpsons. Yes. Are there so many Rocky Rockies? Five is Rocky Five, Rocky Balboa, or was there a Rocky Five before Rocky Balboa? Yeah, I have no idea. So Rocky Four is where he ends communism. Oh, Rocky Five is where he becomes a street fighter. That's right. Um, so Rocky Five is a really bad one that's in the eighties. He 80s. falls on hard times. He yeah. falls on hard times and then ends up becoming a street fighter. And then Rocky Balboa is Rocky Six. And mentors fire young boxer Tommy. Yeah, yeah, yeah Rocky yeah, yeah. Balboa is the name Rocky of- Six. Yes. And then so, Creed is in 2015, and right. then Creed 2 in 2018. So Rocky Balboa is the like boomer fantasy. We can still we can still punch. We can still like I hang with the gun. millennials. Okay, that's Rocky Balboa. Rocky Five is there's inner city blight, and we can solve it through punching. Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, if I recall correctly, Rocky Four was we can solve geopolitical disputes and free markets with punching. And Rocky Five is we can solve all domestic disturbances with, punch, with street fights. When the original Rocky was just I can solve my life with punching. Exactly, yes. and that's why it worked so well. Yes, yeah. yeah. There's a story um, about one single but now, guy. But yeah, that's no, one single guy just you know, just punching his way, to hanging health. out at a pet store <laughs> and punching his way to pet a better meat life. Store, right? He he because he, he punched the. But he goes and he he, he meets Adrian because oh, Adrian right. works the at the pet, pet store, store and right. he wants to buy the turtle, right? Great yeah. movie. And the goldfish. Oh man, it's a great. It wouldn't be great. It really is. Seriously, if you haven't seen Rocky One, do yourself this a favor. This is classical stuff you should know. <laughs> okay. Um, today we are doing Plantagenet, Plantagenet Part Five, where we last left off was a young Edward the Third. Short Shanks. Uh, no, 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 no. That was no, second. That's his. That was his father. No, Long Shanks. Yeah, was Long Edward Shanks the was first. the first, and then Short, Short Shanks, Shanks was Edward the second. This is Edward the Third. Socks. Oh, my goodness. So Edward III, um, his mother and her mother's lover basically kicked the his father off the throne and sent him to jail. And then he eventually and then his father eventually died or escaped to Italy. We don't know. Um, Edward III married beautiful Philippa of Hainault. And at 15, she was pregnant with a child whose name was Edward. And surprise, surprise. Edward the, Edward's mother and her lover were basically in charge of the throne, and Robert Mortimer was the regent, but didn't really want to give up power. And Edward the Third, Third basically, we'll just call him Edward. Edward basically had to wrest power from um, from his his mom's boyfriend, and he did in a daring night raid on the castle of. I think it was Nottingham, Nottingham Castle. Anyway, yeah, wasn't this the you, yeah. last time you were this talking about the, rowdy, king, the yeah. rowdy Kings? And he was sort of like off in the shadows, and That's the right. mom knew. And the mom and, knew. Yeah. And it was all his like night bros that were helping him out. His night bros. Yeah. So Edward the Third, the the hallmark of his reign was that he had good loyal friends, and he sets up this wonderful reign. And he loved tournaments, and he fought in like just regular armor, and no one knew it was him. And then he take out his helmet, and he'd be like, "It's me, your king," and they'd be like, "Oh." And he was the one that took on the name of the lowliest of Arthur's. Not Knights, that's, that's right. right. I'm remembering. So, okay, Edward the Third. He um, something. So in uh, France, Charles the Fourth dies, 
And Charles IV was the last king of the, uh, the, Cap- the Capet line, or Capet, if you are Anglo. Or, or Capet, if Capet, you're Texas. If you're Texas. Capet if you're, the Capet line, if you're Texas, or the Capets. So Charles IV dies, and the line of the Capets dies with him. Um, there is no sort of clear ruler to come in. And this starts a new line of French kings called the Valois. So the Valois uh, line comes in, and Philip VI becomes king of France. So Philip VI is king of France, but it's a new dynasty. It's a new bloodline. And whenever there's a new bloodline, at the beginning, you don't have this tradition of bloodlines. So people are a little bit kind of iffy on whether or not. They don't know if you really deserve to be on the throne. If you really deserve to be on the throne or not. And Edward III, who also had a claim to this throne because of his mother— um, he starts to kind of float the idea out there that may, he's the rightful king of France. Then one day, he in 1340, he goes to a, a crowded marketplace in Ghent. So that's in now modern day Belgium. And he unveils his new colors. And it is the red and golden three lions of England and the blue and gold fleur de lis of France in a sort of like a quadrant pattern. So two, so, so, you know, Top right and bottom left are lions. Top left and bottom right are fleur-de-lis. And it's actually in that movie we watched this week, Age Hannenberg, mm-hmm. it was with uh, Henry V. They had that, that same sort thing. of the same thing. Anyway, so he styles himself. He begins to say that I am the king of France and there is going to be a war of succession. Now, France is weak. England is strong. And he basically wants to reclaim all of the Plantagenet lands that his ancestor, John, Soft Sword. Soft Sword. I remember Soft Sword. He's my favorite. Soft Sword and Lackland mm-hmm. lost. Wasn't so, he the guy that had to contend with Robin Hood? Soft Sword yes. Lackland? Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Robin Hood's same guy? So um, Edward III wants to reclaim all of the, the Plantagenet land. So remember, the Plantagenets come from the Normandy. Like that's where they, they started, was Normandy, northern France. And Aquitaine. Um, so Aquitaine and Normandy and then Belgium kind of create a um, the, uh, like a small case letter R around France. So the northern part of France, if you put a letter R over it, that's, that's Normandy and Aquitaine down towards Spain. Or um, one of those um, uh, Tetris blocks that have two across and four down. Okay. <laughs> I got you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so, so his claim is legitimate. It's not like... It is legitimate. It is, wouldn't be like a guy now, the, the prime minister of England saying, also, I'm in charge of France. Exactly. Yeah. So when he was not legitimate when there was the Capet line, because that was a strong line, but now that there's this new Valois line, he has as much claim to the throne as Charles VI. Sorry, Philip VI. Okay. So he says, We're, I'm doing this, where I'm taking over France, and he puts together a fleet. Now... We know England, and England sort of has stylized itself up until, I guess, World War II when its sort of power started to wane as controlling the seas. Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves is their song. So Britain has always been in naval battle. Well, actually, that's not true. They haven't always been in naval battle. Um, they, they had one battle that sort of solidified them to becoming the the military power of the seas, and that started with Edward III. So up till then, France had perhaps the best navy in the world. And everyone was like, well, dude, you're not going to be able to invade France. Their navy is way better than your navy. Their boats are bigger. Their, their sailors are more experienced. You're not going to do this. So Edward III had a smaller navy. He kind of had, it was kind of nimble. But small and um, and the boats themselves were not as, as impressive. So the French realized that Edward was going to invade. So they got every single boat that they have and they put it up um, by the River Zwin. I don't know where the River Zwin is, um, but um, uh, close to this town called Sluy, S L U Y S. And so it was the Battle of Sluy. So they have all their boats there. And no, oh, but, well, hmm. I wonder where that name S L U I S Y S Y S Sui Sui. I wonder if someone was just like, here, piggy, you pig, no, pig, 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 Sui. You know, the guy that was in charge was named Louis, and they're like, who's, who's that guy? Sui Sui Sui. Um, S Louis. Um, that's most likely it. Classical stuff you should know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Tweet about it. So they have all their boats there, and everyone said to Edward, "You're not going to win this battle." And Edward gave a big speech to his men. He said, those who are afraid can stay at home. And all his sort of men were 
And they decided to come anyway. But the French did one um, tactical problem. So, mil- so boat battles back then were sort of scrambling bloody affairs. Basically what they would do, they didn't have cannons, remember. So what they would do is they would fire arrows at each other and they would fire flaming arrows at each other to try to burn their boat down. And they would ram their boats into each other. So boats would ram each other and then you would have these little grappling hooks and your boat would attach itself to the other boat and then all your dudes, once all the arrows were discharged, they would jump on the boat and do hand-to-hand combat. But since there was no retreating, like you couldn't retreat and go anywhere, it was desperate bloody affairs. So it was um, battles to the death, whereas battles on land didn't necessarily need to be to the death. You could outmaneuver your opponent and and take the high ground and all these sorts of things, and they could run away, and you'd be like, ha-ha, we win. In a boat battle, you could not. And there's no cavalry. That's right. There's no cavalry charges, exactly. There shouldn't be. Or there shouldn't be. If you're (laughs) you're running cavalry, a cavalry? Like, that's not... Clock, clock, clock. You're doing it wrong. Yeah. Um, so the French said, okay, this is going to be uh, a hand-to-hand combat bloody affair. So what they did was they um, they tethered all of their boats together. So they basically made two big super boats from their entire <laughs> fleet tethered together. <laughs> this was not a good tactical maneuver. No, it sounds like a horrible it's idea. It's because what happens if you set one on fire? Yes. So um, yeah, what happened was these fire. these yeah. boats were all tethered together and they had absolutely zero maneuverability. And right. Edward III's boats could um, sort of boat up within bow range and launch a bunch of bows and then scoot back and then come back and forth. And they basically just lobbed arrows at these boats that couldn't maneuver. And the French were like, oh, crap, we have made a bad decision. Um, <laughs> That's exactly yeah. what they were like. Yeah. So um, – uh, this introduces a feature that is going to be a huge feature of Edward III's reign, and that is the longbow. So the longbow was a new invention, and the English were especially proficient in it. So a short bow is what it sounds like. The um, the bow is, you know, not all that... It's your standard hunting bow, I think, It's like right? your standard hunting bow. bow. The longbow is almost... It's like four feet. Right. It's almost the height of a man. And it, it, it takes an incredible amount of skill to pull back and to aim properly. Right. Uh, an amount of training. But... Um, Edward's men were absolutely proficient in it. Um, and it could fire farther than crossbow. And uh, it could fire with such force that a longbow bolt could puncture the armor, plate mail armor of the day. Yeah. Dang. Yes. Yep. That um, is, that is new fact, tech indeed. In fact, um, the British army continued to lose the longbow into the, I think, the 18th century because they were more accurate and more deadly than, um, than basic rifles. Hmm. So they used the longbow for like 400 years, and wow. it was still efficient. And then eventually rifles took over as being the, the method. Anyway, so they could sort of boot, they could scoot these boats up, fire longbow, kill a bunch of people, and scoot back, and the little crossbow bolts couldn't do anything. And then when they sort of weakened the French military, uh, the British boats would come up, grapple with the um, uh, uh, to the French shackled boats, and then there was uh, a bloody hand-to-hand combat. The entire French fleet was destroyed at the Battle of Sluis. Um, one uh, chronicler said that in the by the at the mouth of the river's wind there was more blood than water. Wow! Um, the French lost, I think, something like ten thousand men that day, and the British not very many. Oh my gosh! And um, they said uh, another commentator said there were so many dead Frenchmen in the ground that if you caught a fish. And it would speak French <laughs> because it wow. had eaten all these Frenchmen and learned the language. Wow. So there were so many dead Frenchmen Yikes. in the ground that the fish spoke French. Um, this was an absolute catastrophe for, um, uh, for France. Um, and it paved the way for Edward III to be able to invade the country. Um, but his, del- his invasion was delayed because he was deeply in debt to a bunch of Italian bankers. Um, so if you want to go back and listen to our podcast on usury, uh, right. you can. It's probably like a year and a half ago. Um, but these Italian bankers had kind of like figured out ways that they could charge interest without being sinful or without being against the Catholic Church. So this is the beginning of those Italian bank houses. And so there's this one Italian bank house who owed or who was owed a lot of money from Edward III, and they rose to prominence in their name. I can't remember. Um, they eventually went bankrupt because Edward III said, ah, I'm not paying and I've got a big army. 
and there's nothing they could do about it. <laughs> yep. And they That's went bankrupt. That's one way to get out of your car loan. Yep. They went bankrupt, and then the Medici's um, came in and rose uh, in the vacuum hmm. that this other uh, this other failed bank house left. Anyway, um, so Edward III was in huge debt to this to this Italian bank, and so he's got to go home and raise taxes. And then there's a sort of big kerfuffle with the church because the church is like, you shouldn't raise so much taxes. You're poor subjects. And he's like, am I going to take over France or not? You want to take over France, England? We, then you got to pay some taxes. Um, um, the Archbishop of Canterbury fought him at every turn with this, and it looked like there was going to probably be a serious conflict between Edward III and the church. And we've seen conflicts between kings and church before. Think back to Henry II and um, and uh, his buddy getting his head chopped off, uh, Thomas Becket, yeah. or John getting excommunicated by the Pope mm-hmm. and no one could get married. So... Everyone's like, ah, dang it, we're in for another bloody affair with the church. But Edward III and the church were able to hash out a deal, and Edward lowered taxes and just decided to stay in massive debt. And he said to himself, all right, what I'll do is I'll try to capture as many high-ranking Frenchmen as I can and and, um, um, ransom them them back, and that's how we're going to pay back these Italians. Because that wasn't, I mean, they had already done the, paid the king's ransom for... Edward, oh, sorry, Richard, Richard. The Richard Lionheart. Yes, and they paid yeah. um, uh, an Just exorbitant amount of an money. Insane amount of money. Okay, so um, so so now it's been six years since the Battle of Sluis, and he goes back to France, back to Normandy, and he's trying um, um, he's trying to take over the land that used to be Plantagenet land. He tells his men, "Do not molest the locals. Do not destroy their crops. This is our land." Some of them listened. Some of them didn't. War is a pretty terrible business. Um, but so... Because uh, yeah, he, he was hoping these people would be his future subjects. That's right. They were going to be so his future subjects. So stealing all their cows and messing with them and being horrible would mean yeah. they, they would, as soon as he became king, rebel. That's right. Don't don't burn their vineyards. We want some wine in the future. Yeah. Um, so he has his army, and at the vanguard of his army, at the head of his army, stands his 16-year-old son, Edward, Prince of Wales, known as the Black Prince. So Edward, Prince of Wales, um, uh, in um, l- him and his buddies, Edward, Prince of Wales, including uh, Edward, Prince of Wales, the Black. I'm just going to refer to him as the Black Prince. The Black Prince's best friend was named Richard Mortimer, who was the son of Robert Mortimer, who was his father's, his grandmother's lover. Anyway, but they were best buddies. Great. And so they all and land. He's the Beige Prince. And the Beige Prince. <laughs> and the, and the Black. <laughs> so the Black Prince and his friends land as 16 year olds on the coast of France and are immediately knighted by their father to become knights in his army. And the Black Prince asks to be given the van of the army. And AJ, what is the vanguard of the army? It's the very front. It's where you usually don't want to be. That's right. right. So he asks his father if he can be in the vanguard of the army, and his father uh, agrees. Says no. Really? His father agrees. And uh, why his would you not son, honor such? Yes, he's you know, going to get himself killed. Your son. His son, in his black armor, goes to the front of his army, and they begin to move towards um, an important city called Calais. Okay, as they go, the French muster the entirety of their army outnumbering the British easily two to one. And they get to a small town called Crecy, C-R-E-C-Y, on August 26, 1346. So the Battle of Crecy had um, something like 25,000 French soldiers, probably something like 5,000 armored knights, and 20,000 of men with pointy sticks and T-shirts. Okay. Like, you know, the regular sort of troops, yeah. as we've talked about before. Yes. Stickmen. The fr- Stickmen. The French cavalry was feared across all of Christendom as to being the most organized and the best soldiers in, in all of, of Christendom. These, they would ride, they could break lines, they were organized, their horses wore armor, they were um, mounted basically like tanks. Um, so you had this entire French um, uh, uh, cavalry waiting to charge um, half the number that the British army had. The British, for whatever they they seemed to rely on the fact they did not want they did not ride um, uh, into armor into battle. Their their knights actually were on foot. They were they had um, plate mail, but they fought. Uh, on feet, they didn't ride on horses and do charges back and forth with lances and stuff. They fought on foot with swords and shields. 
with the 16-year-old black prince in the van. So um, the uh, British um, uh, infantry um, lined up in two lines of infantry, one kind of towards the front and one a little bit behind them. The black prince controlling the front, the king controlling the one behind. And then on either flanks of the infantry were banks of longbowmen, and those longbowmen created like a little barricade of all of their food wagons so that it w- the horses couldn't easily charge them. So the horses couldn't flank the archers and come in on the sides because there was this giant wall of wagons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we are foiled by wagons. <laughs> um, Why can't we just roll them out of the way? <laughs> yeah. So the, essentially the archers made little pillboxes for mm-hmm. themselves with wagons. Right. And so they stood there and um, uh, they marched forward. And the French, being in tactical numerical superiority with their beautiful uh, Genoese mercenaries, you know, these Italian mercenaries, um, um, uh, basically sort of um, uh, the old fable goes is that they stood in front of each other and hurled insults at each other for most of the day on August 26th. They happened? just yelled really? insults back and wow. forth. Okay. At about 5 p.m. it began to rain. And the battle began to commence. Now, this is crazy to think that the battle is going to begin as the sun is setting. You don't have tons of time. So the French did what they normally do, and that is they sent in their crossbowmen first. So they marched the crossbowmen to the line of where they figured they had been. So sent them, yeah, sent them forward and began to lob crossbow bolts, but they were falling short. And that's when they so, get the, so, so the English get their longbowmen out. That's right. right. The long yeah. So the English like get their longbowmen out. out, and they began to fire their their longbow bow bolts at the crossbowmen, and the crossbowmen refused to go any further because to actually hit the the archers with their crossbows, they had to go further, and then right. they were easier targets, and they were getting pick, picked off. The longbowmen could fire five or six arrow per archer per minute. Wow. Um, so that's a lot of arrows flying right. uh, from archers. So I'm um, just like, if you just sort of think about, we have an archery class at school, <laughs> and I'm just thinking about our kids doing archery outside with the targets. I'm like, can they fire, do you think they could fire six arrows per minute? That's, no. that's one every 10 seconds or so. That's not bad mm-hmm. at all. One, but, one thousand, two, one thousand. You have enough time yeah, to, to, to aim, reload, to aim, pull and back. Then fire. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, so this is what they could do. But the thing is they could do it accurately. So right. help me understand. I... For some reason in my head, I have an image of them with these giant bows laying on their back with their feet and launching them oh, pulling I back on the ground. Um, some did that, but but um, there were because versions of the long bows a, that could do that. You could create an enormous bow that way, yeah. and the draw strength was insane. I'm um, just wondering if that's actually a true thing no, that happened. No, I, I don't. Maybe it did, but not in this case. These long bowmen were, were standing. I'm looking at a painting, and they're standing up. Okay. Um, it's it's the Battle of Cressy, and it has the long bowmen standing up. Yeah. Um, well, when was the painting done? I don't know. Sometimes that makes difference. Actually, you know the uh, uh, how flipping somebody off with the middle finger is considered a, a rude gesture? Well, this came from uh, what the French would do. Whenever the French would... Ca- so to pull back the bow, you needed to pull back. You needed your middle finger um, to do it. You needed your first two fingers to pull it back. Uh, and that was how you pulled it back. So when the French would capture um, British longbowmen, they would chop off their middle finger so that if right. they, this actually like Cicero. No, yeah. I, my, I thought that they would, uh, that's why it's a little bit different in France and England. Why in England it's the two fingers is because they would hold it with two fingers. Mm, and maybe. in France, they would, they would do, do it with one. just their middle finger. And so either way, it was showing that you haven't caught me and I can still kill you. Maybe, I, but in, I thought it was uh, the French would then mock the British by flipping them off with the one finger, basically saying, I still have mine and you don't have yours. Oh, anyway, okay. maybe not. Maybe oh. so listener, Well, if it's you, from archery one way or the other. Listener, if you know the history of flipping people off, yeah, you can great. email us at classicalstuff.fairtossacademy.net. <laughs> anyway, so the longbowmen got to work and they made short work of the crossbowmen and the crossbowmen um, refused to go further. The cavalry took this as cowardice of their crossbowmen and decided to charge. The cavalry... Oh, no. The cavalry straight on charged the the infantry. And as they were riding towards the infantry, the uh, longbowmen um, shot at them. And uh, the the sort of the middle of the field became a mass of muddy, because it was raining, um, writhing horses and men and, and, and sort of the screams therein. The Battle of Crecy also saw, for the first time in Europe, cannon fire. 
So Edward III had this new invention called the cannon. He found that he got this gunpowder. Didn't have very much of it and wasn't very big. It was like the size of a sort of a handheld tube. Oh. And it wasn't all that um, accurate. But basically what they would do is they would just shove a ball in a tube and put some gunpowder in there and light it and then aim it in a general direction and hopefully hit somebody with it. Wasn't all that accurate. Uh, didn't do that much damage, but the sound was deafening and scary. So for you have this sound of cannons and arrows and screams and horses, and it must have been a terrible sound. Well, I mean, up until that time, it was only swords and, and bows, and those mm-hmm. don't make a lot of noise. So the yeah. the sound of a battle was primarily just screaming. Screaming. But and now you have cannon add fire. cannons or guns, and it gets a lot yes. scarier. So the, for the French, this would have been a, a, nif- a, a new sensation, and then to be basically technologically outgunned with these longbow. And to not know what that is, the new thing that's coming at you. And these these plate mail knights were used to the fact that most crossbow and shortbow bolts would bounce off their armor, or if they stuck in, would not penetrate very deeply. Not so with longbow bolts. Right. So for the first time, um, knights began to fall, be shot from their horses uh, and killed through their armor. And people started to freak out. Okay. Um, the Black Prince at the van fought valiantly. Hey, way A to go, buddy. 16-year-old boy uh, hacking and fighting. But at one point, he was overwhelmed and fell. And to save him, the little dude that stood by him that held his flag. Mortimer. <laughs> I don't know if his name was Mortimer. But his little friend. Oh, that, it wasn't his friend. No, What's it wasn't his, his friend Mortimer. No, okay. uh, he, it was his flag bearer. So what, if you were an, an important person, you had somebody that didn't fight. They just stood close to you with a flag so that people could tell where you were on the battlefield. Yeah, Because right, if all your commanders are down, yeah. what's the point of fighting anymore? And so, and then if you, you know, knocked, if you killed somebody and their flag went down, that would be a great, you know, emotional boost to your team. So... Uh, the Black Prince was knocked down, and his flag bearer dropped the flag to help the Black Prince Uh-oh. up, and everybody thought the Black Prince had been slain. Right. So, um, um, a messenger from the Black Prince infantry came back to the king and said, um, uh, and, and reported this, and the king said, is my son felled or dead? And then, here, let me just read this little section. Um, is my son felled or uh, dead or felled, asked Edward according to the chronicler, informed that the prince was not dead, but faced difficult odds. Um, Foisar, his military man, uh, has Edward's reply. So, so basically the guy came back and said, he's not dead, but he needs troops. You need to go save the black prince. And Edward said this, return to him and to them that sent you here and say that they send no more to me for any adventure. As long as my son is alive they suffer him this day to win his spurs. So basically he says, you're not getting any more troops. Right. Uh, as long as my son is alive, um, he is going to have to fight this out on his own and win his spurs. That's good. And win his spurs he did. Yeah. Um, Edward, the uh, Black Prince, gets, gets back up and he fights the rest of the fight. And the, the day is a, a resounding victory for the British. The Battle of Crecy rings in um, English uh, uh, sort of uh, memory until 100 years later with the Battle of Agincourt and Henry V. This is the, one of the greatest military victories that the, crown, the British crown had ever experienced, the Battle of Crecy. 1,542 French noblemen, French knights Whoa, died. That's heavy. Um, an innumerable amount of their army, right. absolutely decimated. Um, um, so um, I'm just trying to remember what, sort of what happened at the end of this battle. I'm getting it confused with another one. Um, yes, there. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yes. There's another great story in this battle. So as the battle was turning, um, and the French realized that they were they were going to lose, uh, a lot of them kind of. A lot of people, and one of the allies, Bohemia to France, was going to kind of like pull their troops back and leave. But the French king of Bohemia, um, he was known as John the Blind, because he was blind. That's a good um, reason. He was there at the battle. He was blind. He couldn't see anything. And they were saying to him, John, King John, um, your troops are losing heart, and they're going to flee. And John said, lead me into the fray. Mm-hmm. And John the Blind went and rallied his troops, blind though he was, and fought against the English in the Battle of Crecy. And when the battle was done, 
They found John the Blind, old king of Bohemia, like an old dude. They found him slain and killed, surrounded by his attendants who stayed with him until the bitter end, also slain. Um, um, two, at the end of the battle, two dukes, four counts, and one king was killed. Those were the highest oh. men. Um, and Edward III and his son, the Black Prince, had a noble funeral cer- ceremony for these felled enemy. So they had this big old funeral for these for the king of Bohemia, these two dukes, and these four uh, these four counts. Um, and um, anyway, um, so f- you know this was a, a resounding victory for the for the English, and um, so they then. Um, had their army, the French were completely routed, and they went to seize their first big town, which would afford them a castle, which they could then keep Normandy. Or at least they could, like, go to the bathroom. That's right, right? yes, they, yeah, and get changed clothes. Yeah, they've been marching around for a while. Mm-hmm. It's no good. And so they go, and they siege the city of Calais. Now, Calais is in the north of France, and if you held this city, you basically held, held the power base in, in the north of France. So they sieged Calais. The French army was routed. They could not come and break the siege. And Edward III set up camp and sieged the city for over a year. Wow. The city ran out of food. Um, Legend has it that the city was so desperate that for a year they ate their leather from their saddles, that they would boil it and chew on it to uh, to, uh, try to get suck nutrients from the leather. Um, um, At one point... Um, Edward came to the noblemen and he said, you know, your French, I think the French tried to like break the siege every now and then and just couldn't do it. They just didn't have enough troops. And so Calais knew that they were going to starve to death. And Edward came and he said, I will spare the city if you send me all of your burgers. Now that's, <laughs> that sounds funny because it sounds like hamburgers. Right. Um, but what he meant was we all of your, basically your noble families, your oh. noble men, the men who run the city. So these burgers got together and they had this, they basically like the, the city council. And they said, um, we will go and we will throw ourselves at the King's mercy. So they dressed themselves in sack clothes, they put ash on their head, and they wore nooses around their mm-hmm. neck to symbolize their subjection to Edward. And they exited the city. These, these men who would have only ever lived in royal clothes, these great burghers being like they were, they were merchants and, uh, and noblemen. I know it's funny. I'm just imagining them in buns. That's the only right, problem. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I mean, if you ran a hamburger store in Calais, you're calling it the burger of Calais. I mean, that's yeah, just, you definitely. have to. Yeah. So the, these famous burgers of Calais have been depicted in art um, and sculpture. The, the one I'm thinking of is there's a Rodin sculpture, a very famous Rodin sculpture of the burgers of Calais. And it's these these noble men wearing um, sackcloths and noose, nooses around their neck and coming and throwing themselves at Edward III's mercy. And Edward III um, allowed, uh, uh, put them on trial. It was pretty obvious that he was never going to kill them, but he kind of put them on trial as if he was going to. And the person that he had defending them was his wife, Philippa. So Philippa, in a great show of chivalry, and the sort of pageant stood up and pleaded to her husband for mercy for these burghers of Calais. And here they are, these noble men wearing like um, nasty pajamas and nooses around their neck right. and pleaded that, they, that he um, have mercy. Now, remember, Philip was from Hainault. Hainault is in Belgium. Belgium is in the north of France, just to the east of Calais. So these are more her people than the British. But anyway, right. so she's pleading for these people and the king relents and he allows the burghers to survive and he seizes Calais. Edward III now has Normandy back. Um, that the, 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 the sacred homeland of the Plantagenets. Um, he, he takes back what John soft sword la- uh, lost. Yeah. Okay. Um, and this entered a bit of a time of peace and prosperity. At this point, the king is 35 years old. The queen is 33, and they have nine children. Wow. Uh, Edward, the Black Prince. I can only think of what I've done at 35. Yes, 35. I've like, I've like, you know, what did I, like a, a cookie today. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's your accomplishment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, anyway, so yeah, I have not besieged a town. Although that's probably a good thing. Probably good. Yeah. He had Edward, the Black Prince, who was his oldest, and in line for the throne, he was, he was destined to be Edward the Fourth, or so they thought. Uh, his other oh, son, spoilers. his Seriously. other son, Lionel, Lionel of Antwerp, 
uh, named after the lowliest knight of the round table. Um, his third boy, John of Gaunt, who ends up becoming a very important person in, as the story moves forward, John of Gaunt. In fact, John of Gaunt has one of my favorite speeches of all of Shakespeare in uh, Richard II. But anyway, um, oh, England, England, a tiny island, or what is a, 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 a tiny world? Uh, anyway, I can't remember how this whole speech goes. And then he has other, another boy, Edward of Langley, and he had some daughters, Isabella, who was 16 when the king was 35, and Joan, who was 15. So, not it has been a long time since there has been a powerful established king of England who had a, um, who had a family that has survived into adulthood. So what do you, what do you, if you have a bunch of kids who are like, you know, hot commodities in the world and you want to establish yourself as a power base, what do you do with all your little kids? Give them lands. Yep. And he does that to his boys and to his girls. Marries them off. Marry them off. So he now needs to marry them all off to secure his uh, power base. Um, So yes, he gives his, his son's land. Um, He eventually ends up giving um, Edward, the black prince gets, um, um, Aquitaine, which is on the uh, west coast of France, um, sort of north of Spain. Um, Lionel ends up getting Ireland. Uh, John of Gaunt ends up getting Normandy. And Edward of Langley, no, John of Gaunt gets Scotland. Anyway, I can't remember. It's not really all that important. But um, yeah, so marry your kids off. Uh, <laughs> Lionel himself was betrothed at three years old. Um, which, poor Lionel, like, you know, everything's ded- uh, dedicated. But um, Joan, Joan was the second daughter and she was 15 years old and she was the first to be married. I can't remember who Isabella married. I I can't remember if it's all that important, but Joan was going to be married to the King of Castile. Does anybody know where Castile is? Nope. Hennenberg? That's where they keep the French prisoners, right? (laughs) The Castile, the Castile. (laughs) Uh, it's in Northern Spain. No, okay. Between Old Castile and New Castile. Oh, there you go. This was really helpful. Thank you, So, it's in the north of Spain. Uh, It was its own little kingdom, the kingdom of Castile. So, Spain did not become a unified kingdom for many years. There was uh, Castile, and there was Aragon, and uh, there was a couple of other kingdoms in there. I can't remember. And then, of course, there was, uh, in the south, there was, those lands were mostly um, uh, Muslim, uh, Islam, uh, um, pushing us far into Spain. Uh, Anyway. So Joan was going to marry Peter, son of Alfonso the Eleventh of Castile, and it was going to be a wedding of incredible mirth and beauty. And um, Joan had a dress that had four hundred and fifty feet of silk woven with golden thread. This beautiful wedding dress, and so they put Joan on a boat. And she sails from Portsmouth to Bordeaux, and then off to Castile. And as they dock in Bordeaux, uh, a little man comes running to the boat and he says, Joan, you and your hundred archers and all of and your la- ladies in waiting, you cannot come into the town of Bordeaux. There is a plague. There had been rumors of this plague. People had heard about some mysterious death that had been coming from the steppes of the east, spreading itself through Europe. No way. Um, but is nobody, this, black death? this is the Black so Death. Excited. But nobody, but there had just been rumors of it. The Black Death came from uh, somewhere in Mongolia and spread into the west, and it moved at about two miles a day, this plague. Isn't that incredible just to yep. think about? Um, and uh, so let's talk a little bit about the Black Death. So the Black Death it comes um, from fleas, right? Uh, yeah, it just comes from, uh, I think it's a bacterial infection. Um, and, um, but the, the symptoms would be that you would first get little spots, little white spots the size of almonds. And then those uh, almonds would grow into the size of basically like tennis balls. And they would, if I remember correctly, they would go mainly to where your, your lymph nodes were. So you would get big old bulbous sores underneath your armpit. That's great. And you would get big old bulbous sores on your neck. So much so that it would, if you had this, the Black Death, it would permanently cock your head to the side because it had this big bulbous sore. So everyone kind of had this cock-headed look, and maybe their arm was lifted up because it had this growth underneath their arm. So you ended up looking misshapen. Um, uh, Then you also had these dark blotches, and they called them God's tokens because it meant that you had been touched with God's angel of death. Um, so you had these bulbous pussy sores and these black marks Ugh. and you, everybody stunk. If you had the black death, you stunk. Your saliva stunk, your sweat stunk, you stunk. 
you were a stinky, stinky person. Yeah. Um, uh, the Black Death ended up killing one third of the population of Europe. It killed ha- the half of the population of England on the first go around. Oh my word. But no one had heard about it yet. There was just rumors of it coming. So Joan and her uh, and her party were like, well, that sounds bad, but they shrugged it off and they went into Bordeaux. Oh, Joan, no! Bummer. So beautiful 15-year-old Joan with her 450-foot silk wedding dress entered the town of Bordeaux for a couple of days before they would sail onto Castile and her betrothed Peter, son of Alfonso. <laughs> um Joan and her and her wedding party feasted and made merry, but one of after a couple of days, one of their friends in the wedding party started feeling a little a little sick. Ugh. He didn't feel so good. Um, I can't remember his name, but he ended up getting the plague, and he was upstairs. The, the, the chronicler says that he was upstairs dying while the revelry, revelry of the wedding and right. the and the um, the happy merriment was happening downstairs. Um, on September of thirteen forty eight. Joan died of the plague and was never, never Joan. got to wear her wedding dress sad. as 15 years old. That's sad. Great sorrow for uh, Edward and his wife, Philippa. Um, no one really knows what happened to Joan's body. That's actually a mystery of history. Uh, they didn't, Joan never came back to England, probably because they were scared of this plague. Right. Mm-hmm. But we don't really know where she was buried or what happened to her. So this sort of this this, this star of English um, uh, Christendom died early and kind of just sort of faded and disappeared because of this encroaching black death. Well, I mean, she might have been burned. That was, that was probably what yeah. you did with bodies. Well, I don't know about noblemen. But from right. 1348 yeah, when she died to 1351, so just a few short years Half of the population of England died that's, by the plague. That's three years. Yeah. yeah. Died. Half the population. Towns were decimated. Armies were decimated. So that changes your plans for taking over France. If That's right. If half if of your dudes die. But then also got. half the French dudes die. Right. They, it, it was a period of, it must have been profound psychological shock. Why is this happening? It must have seemed like God's curse upon the earth. Um. Uh, everything kinds of everything kind of stops. Edward has a a kingdom where every house is touched by death, mm. every family in mourning for somebody who was dying. Um, um, actually, fun fact, a fun story happens from the Black Death, which um, is a sentence that I will write down. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, so there was these thieves in France. And they uh, made a lot of money because they would go into houses where people were dying of the Black Death. No one would go into those houses. You would mark the door with an X and no one would go in because if you went in, you're going to die. Right. And these thieves would go in and steal all their nice stuff and never get sick. And um, they were eventually caught by the, uh, the, the leading, you know, sort of the police, the gendarmes of France. And they said uh, they were super rich because of all this thievery. And they said, listen. If you can tell us why, how you're not dying by going into these people's houses, we will let you live and we won't kill you. We won't execute you for thievery. And the, um, the thieves said that they had a concoction. They actually had a, um, uh, a mixture of oils that they would rub on themselves. Um, and uh, uh, they would rub it all, all over their body. And when they went in uh, and they came out, it seemed to work. They didn't, never got sick and they did it every time. And so the French government said, if you give us the recipe for this concoction, we'll let you live. And they did, and they ended up living. And um, there's, that's an, it's a mixture, and you can actually still buy it to this day. It's called Thieves. You can go online. There's an essential oil mixture called Thieves, and the ingredients are fairly basic things. But it has been medically shown to kill germs, okay. that it is something that if you, really? that if cool. you wear, it will— um, Interesting. It is. Uh, I, actually, I, uh, my wife— um, uh, um, used it and I thought she was sort of like a little forest elf witchcraft mm-hmm. um, but I, I used it whenever uh, there's ever people at, at Veritas uh, get sick during the flu season and uh, for the past two years I haven't really gotten sick whenever huh. it comes on just put, put a little bit on your wrists mm-hmm. put a little bit on your tongue um, and yeah it's been medically proven that the stuff in there is things that sort of kill wait like inside you or just like if it's Huh? Like the cloud of scent kills things, or no, no, is no, it it's just, just in um, your body? So if you helps? put if you put it on sort of the, your extremities or the places where you would be touching things, or if you put it on your tongue, uh, uh, it just you know if your 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 openings hmm. where you're going to get sick, your hands, so your hands and your yeah. mouth basically, uh, it helps to uh, kill the germs. Anyway, so these thieves cool. did it and they and they survived. Fun fact. So Black Death. <laughs> um, 
So the king and word the third had a basically like a morale problem. Right. Everybody was dying. People were bummed. So he did what he did best, which is hold tournaments. And people love tournaments and people would show up. And even though there was black death, um, they would still do these great tournaments. Um, and uh, he also started a society. Uh, and this society was called um, the Order of the Garter. And it's the Order of the Garter still exists today. Hmm. Um, um, anyway, the Order of the Garter, uh, um, uh, the, the rumor has it that uh, the way that this, the name came up was they were at a big dance and this lady was dancing and her garter that she wore around her, her thigh fell off on the ground and the, pink, the king picked it up and said something witty and clever. And everyone was like, ha, 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 ha. So they called themselves the Order of the Garter. It's basically like a bros club, but the Order of the Garter still exists. Um, the rule is they had 26 members and you can't have a new member until an old member dies. Oh. And this became a really popular thing to do. There was the Order of the Garter. There was the Society of the Band. There was the Society of the Buckle. There was the Order of the Black Swan. All these different, like, gentlemen societies began to rise of knights. And if you were a valiant knight and you did something, you could win your way into the Order. Um, anyway, so this was something that came up. He built a beautiful chapel that was their headquarters. Um, uh, There's lots of rumors about the Order of the Garter and that they, you know, are still in power and that these orders secretly control the world. But all that's nonsense. Okay. Um, anyway, so he did that. But he that's also, what they want you yeah, to think. Right. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but he had these tournaments. Let me tell you about one great tournament. that was. So the way the tournaments fought would be you would have dulled swords. Wait, hold, hold, pause. Yeah. What's going on in France? Have we still taken over France? or So they, took, they over took over Normandy, and then they sort of paused the war for winter, and then the Black Death was like, oh, let's see what pause happens after this. Yeah. Okay. So they have Normandy, and I think they've got Aquitaine. So they've got kind of half of what they want, and he still wants the crown. But he to, take, to get the crown, he needs to take over the city of, oh, what's it called? Um, Rheim, sorry, Rheim, R-I-E-M-S, because that's the sacred city of where you get crowned. Got if you want to be the king, okay. you got to sit on that throne and, call, and get crowned in that chair. Okay. Just like how there's the throne in Scotland, you got to sit on that throne if you want to be the Scottish king. And then there's the throne in England. If you want to be the king of England, you got to sit on that chair and someone crowns you. You can't just do it. Yeah. So he needs to take over the city of Reims in order to get it. And that's close to Paris. So you basically have to take over Paris to get it. Got it. He hasn't done that yet. Hmm. All right. Um, uh, so uh, he... Um, uh, has these tournaments. And so the way tournaments would work is you have sort of guys with dull swords on either side and maces and stuff, and you would have armor, um, and you would, you know, sort of hack each other back and forth. Well, there was this one tournament where there, these two men on opposite sides were fighting for the same woman because they both claimed to be married to her. So enter Joan of Kent. So Joan of Kent was cousin to the Black Prince, and she was raised in the house of these nine kids um, alongside of them because her dad died or whatever. She was rumored to be, the Chronicler has said a couple things about her. One, she was addicted to jewels, and two, she was the most beautiful woman in Christendom. So Joan of Kent... When rumor has it that, or actually not rumor, it's what happened. When she was 12, um, she fell in love with one sort of knight and they secretly got married um, and reportedly did consummate their marriage, which is sort of important for annulment reasons later. And no one didn't tell anybody. And so she was married for love and it's very romantic. And he goes off to fight in war and she grows up and her parents are like, Joan, it's time for you to get married. And they married her to some lord against her will. Well, she's married to this guy. Her, hus her first husband comes back and says, Joan, I'm back, baby, and declares openly that he's married to Joan of Kent. And this other guy's like, no, I'm married to Joan of Kent. And they would look at her and she'd be like, why not both? <laughs> um, no. So she's, uh, <laughs> so she's there, the most beautiful woman, with two men vying for affection. They fought on opposite sides of the tournament and apparently went at each other pretty hard. Yeah. Eventually, they had to take it to the Pope. The Pope ruled in favor of the first husband. She stayed married to him, had a bunch of his kids, and then he died later in life. And then the other guy's like, so are we married now? And she's like, no, I'm not married to you. So Joan of Kent, be beautiful woman, the most beautiful woman in all of Christendom, was at this tournament. She'll come, she'll be important later. Okay. Um, yeah, to make a long story short, uh, Edward III became the most uh, powerful man in Europe. In 1348, all the German princes said, hey, do you want to be the Holy Roman Emperor? And he said, no, I don't need your crappy empire. I'm making my own thanks. <laughs> um, and um, 
I see what you got, and I'm good. Yep. Yep. On Christmas Eve of 1348, um, a treacherous Italian was going to, uh, it was rumored to open the gates and let the French army into Calais, and uh, Edward's spies came back and said, hey, there's an Italian that's going to open the gates. And so they went over there, and Edward put Edward and the Black Prince put on regular armor, and, they, and them and their knights stood in the street of Calais, and when the treacherous Italian opened the gates and let the French army in, they came in. And then the gates got closed behind them, and they fought toe to toe in the city of Calais with the king and the prince and his dudes, and they killed the French invaders. And it just, it just, you know, grew his. And then at the end, he like took off his helmet. He's like, "I'm the king of England." Um, <laughs> and he, and everyone was like, "Oh my goodness, I thought you were just a regular guy." And it just sort of ended up growing his legend. Yeah. Um, in 1350, um, Philip the Sixth dies. That's the king of France, and John the Second becomes king. And so they're like, all right, let's do this thing. Um, now I'm going to go and I'm going to fight. Um, I'm going to fight. Uh, um, um, so no more tournaments. No, no more tournaments. Now we're going back. John II, uh, let's take it over. Black Death is still going around? or Yeah, it, it would come and go. It would die off in the winter because the, the, the cold would kill. Right. And then... Uh, At it that would, point, you it, just move to Scandinavia. If the cold yeah. kills the plague, it I just might come back. It might not. It would come and go in waves. There was one that came that mainly just killed kids, and oh. that was called uh, the Children's Plague. Sad. And uh, the king lost a daughter or a son in that. Anyway, um, another battle. So John II is now king of France, and they go off and they have this another battle of uh, uh, Poitre. Uh, again, French outnumbered them two to one, and. Um, and uh, the French were goaded into attack by Edward, uh, the Black Prince. The Black Prince was like, come and get me. And the French charged their cavalry at him, but then got trapped in hedges. <laughs> really? So their horses got trapped in these hedges, and then they were slaughtered. Um, but at the end of the Battle of Poitre, it played out pretty much the same way as Crecy, with the longbowmen being superior. Um, the French lost their sacred red oriflamme, which is the uh, battle standard of France oh. that was uh, rumored to have been dipped in the blood of Saint-Denis himself. And they captured John II of France himself. That's kind of a big deal. So they captured the king of France at the yeah. end of the Battle of Poitre. They, he, they set his ransom at 4 million gold écus, which dwarfed the ransom for Richard like 10 times. It was an innumerable, in, unimaginable sum of money for a king. France was ruined. The, city, the, the, the countryside went into chaos. Um, uh, oh, at the end of the Battle of Poitre, they, they had captured all these noblemen, including the king of France, and they had a big feast, and they invited all of the prisoners to come and feast with them, and they actually got to sit at the table with the king, and the king was like, you're my prisoners, ha, 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 and they ate food and everything, and you can imagine the French were like, this sucks. Exactly. Um, but it was kind of nice. This goose is undercooked. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> you hidden um, English. France devolves into chaos, and there's, you know, there's sort of... Um, um, country folk were slaughtering nobles saying you betrayed us and all these sorts of things. Um, and then Edward III turned his attention to the, uh, to the city of Rheim, um, where the sacred church of the crowning would be. And if he had took that over and sat on that throne, he would have crowned himself King of France, Edward I, King of France. But as they went there, their army was stopped by a massive giant hailstorm. A hailstorm so furious that they actually that it killed horses and they had to turn back. Wow. They never took Rheim, even because of this act of God. And the French, to this, you know, sort of say, like, God protected our sacred throne. Um, so Edward III negotiated a peace. He just gave up after he that? He gave up after that. One hailstorm and he's like, yeah, well, I guess the Black that, Plague, that. Plague had really taken its toll right. on, on all his units, on all his men. He negotiated a peace with John II to get back Aquitaine, Poitou, Seng, all these other places, uh, basically all of the lands that, his, that John Soft Sword had lost, and then some. So he ended, up having a, uh, he ended up having a portion of France that was bigger than what the French king ended up having and then they ransomed the french king for only three million gold aq wow. well there goes his money problem right mm -hmm. so he ended up uh as a 50 year old man he ended up living in luxury and went back to england and hunted he lived in his hunting lodge aquitaine went to the black prince the most famous knight in all of europe and the black prince went into war Allied with, unfortunately, King Pedro the Cruel. Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> what? I know. So King Pedro the Cruel and the Black Prince were buddies. Not really. Pedro was a bad guy, but... Um, Sounds like it. But I mean, they don't call him, like, Pedro the Amiable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this this is a golden time. This is when Chaucer writes the Canterbury Tales. Hmm. This is the queen built a beautiful palace for herself where she, where she had one room for sleeping, ru- one room for dancing, one room for prayer, and one room just full of mirrors to look at herself. Um, Which would have been insanely expensive yes, at this time. Mm-hmm. Mirrors were... Mm-hmm. Mirrors were n- not common and hard to come by. The king lost two other daughters, Mary and Margaret, in the child's plague. Um, and um, Wait, who's the king at this point? Is it still hunting? Still Edward the Third. Okay. Still Edward the Third. Um, Edward the Black Prince is still unmarried, and he's in his late twenties, early thirties, and he has Aquitaine, and he ends up marrying his yeah. cousin Joan of Kent. So the beautiful Joan Wait, of Kent cute marries Joan? Yeah. cute Joan marries the Black Prince, which is okay at this time, right? Yes, Marian cousins. But it was a scandal because she had been married thrice, three yes. times, and once to the same uh, at the same time. Anyway, so she yeah. was kind of a scandalous lady. But they married for love. She didn't give him any lands, and they mar- they grew up together, which is kind of weird. And they're married. Um. Uh. Black Prince, uh, the Black Prince goes off and he fights his campaign in Spain. And while he's there, he gets sick. Um, he's fighting Henry of uh, Trasimara in Spain and he gets sick and it turns out that he gets dysentery. And dysentery ended up immobilizing him and uh, sucked all of his vigor and life. And the future king of England was left feebled and infirm. From dysentery, um, and at the bat, uh, at this was t- dysentery sort of like a catch-all for all kinds of diseases. Yeah, I think. I mean, it's. I don't know what it ended up being, but he because dysentery he, just means kind of like diarrhea, right? Yeah, but he had this illness that completely sapped him of strength, and um, yeah, it could have been dysentery, could have been something else, but it sapped him of strength. At the time of this battle in Spain, he had a son named Richard, uh, who will be the subject of our next podcast, but. Um, um, in, so at this time, Edward III is an old man hunting in his grounds of, um, of, uh, Northern England. His wife, Philippa gets old and dies and he apparently weeps for days. Um, and then in 1371, his black prince son goes back to Agincourt, no, not Agincourt, goes back to, um, um, Aquitaine, a broken man sapped of all his strength. Um, John of Gaunt is the sort of the most powerful uh, man. He essentially becomes regent because the king is immobilized. He's getting old. He's sad for his dead wife, Philippa. He takes, he has like a, a, a mistress that comforts him in his old age. And then in 1376, the black prince dies mm. at 36 years old. This, the, the hope of England. Well, let me just read uh, this section of when the Black Prince dies early. Um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, said this. This one, the Black Prince, he knew he was dying and he gave these instructions for his funeral. When our body is taken through the town of Canterbury to the Priory, two destriers covered with our arms and two men armed in our arms and in our helms shall go before our body. That is, one with our whole arms of war quartered and the other with our arms of peace, with the badges of ostrich feathers, with four banners of the same suit. Each of those who carry the said banners shall have on his head a hat with our arms. He who wears the arms of war shall have an armed man by him carrying a black pennon with ostrich feathers. And then this commentator says, It was a soldier's passing. His tomb was decked in the symbols of the Holy Trinity, for which he reserved great reverence, and decorated with his armor, symbols of his military power, and his motto, Ich Dien, or I Serve. In his later life, blighted by illness, the prince had become morbid, depressed by the fact that his warrior's spirit could not overcome his fragile flesh. His will requested that a French poem be inscribed around his tomb in Canterbury Cathedral, warning others of the same peril. And this is the poem on his tomb, the Black Prince, this star of Christendom who died as a young man. Such as thou art, sometime was I. Such as I am, such shalt thou be. I thought little on the hour of death, 
so long as I enjoyed breath. But now a wretched captive am I. Deep in the ground, lo, here I lie. My beauty great is all quite gone. My flesh is wasted to the bone. The Black Prince dies. Edward III, an old man, um, uh, is, is teetering towards death. And the next in line for the throne is a nine-year-old boy, Richard. Uh, and that's where we're going to end this story, is where Richard, this young man, uh, uh, is next in line to be king of England. His father's promise had never been realized. And this poor boy is going to be thrust into the center of British politics um, um, coming forward. Uh, as th this great man, Edward III, was nearing the end of his life, and his son of such promise and such martial valor uh, was cut off uh, before his time. And that ends our story of the Black Prince and Edward III. Uh, Man, so lots to think about. Yeah, there's a whole lot of downers in there. At the end, it's such glory and then such unrealized promise. Yeah, that's such a bummer. Well, hope you guys have a good day out there. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, this is Classical Stuff. You can email us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. You can tweet at us. We are at C-L-S-S-C-A-L stuff. And you can also check out our website, classicalstuff.net. We got, you know, copies of the episodes there if you want to check them out and some paintings that I choose every week. And that's it. This is AJ, Graham, and Thomas. And now I want to go and... I don't just know. no enjoy the enjoy the hours you have, boys. Enjoy something? the time that we have been given. But Graham, that's what he is, I will someday be. That's, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for listening. See you guys later. Ciao.